So, um, who's written anything for iPhone? Is familiar with Objective C? Anybody? All right. So who's who's done anything with Objective C? Written anything for iPhone? I know. So okay. Programming games at all? Written any games a little bit? Okay. So good because I. I I did this really as a very basic introduction of Sprite Kit. Um, we're going to take, we're going to start the, uh, the basically the Sprite Kit template project, and we'll take a little little look at that and explain a few things, and then I'll I'll turn it into a somewhat better working starting you know starting project. It's it's more like a game because the. The project you start with with Sprite Kit is barely even a game. It just throws a little something on the screen and spins it around. So that's not really a good example at all. So we'll at least get a basic game started and then uh, all the files are available on my website if you want to download the project and the slides are up there. So if we, uh, I think we were planning to have time the second half to just go around and anybody that wants to work on Sprite Kit answer some questions and just play around with it so and yeah my name is David Corgan digitalherogames.com is my website uh, my iPhone stuff is up there um, if you're interested check it out so what is Sprite Kit exactly it's the 2D game engine it's uh, part of Apple's uh, core frameworks now it's included with Xcode um, simplify, I mean, I don't want to read it exactly, but it simplifies drawing and animating with a lot of high level calls so you don't have to know anything about the graphics calls um, to do simple 2D games. And uh, most game developers use a game engine, don't write stuff from scratch, so there's lots of good ones out there. Uh, Sprite Kits included, it was based on Cocos 2D, which was also free, so if you've um, if you see examples in Cocos 2D, they will translate almost exactly over to Sprite Kit, just some little syntax differences. And you can even use Sprite Kit for making multimedia apps. You don't have to be a game necessarily, but it just gives you an easy way to get access to graphics and do animations uh, pretty quickly. So if, if you're looking for the UI designer where you drag stuff around, uh, you're going to see that there really isn't one with the basic sprite kit. Most of the games created in code, so it helps to draw out your design on paper to kind of get started with what you want to start building instead of just going into the code and trying to arrange things on a whim. It's a little bit easier to have a little bit of a plan beforehand. And um, Nicholas Cage is there, just want to use him. <laughs> So in, in this Sprite Kit project we're going to create, it gives you uh, this little list of files by default, and I just want to explain what most of them are. We're, we're going to focus basically on the game scene, and that's going to be the core of your game. It's it's like a level, the stage that gets set. Um, it's where you put your sprites, and you have your logic for what what happens when they collide with each other, and all that kind of stuff. And then you can, you can have multiple scenes and say you finish one level, you could load another one, so you could break them up by that style, or if you have, uh, you know, your main menu might be a scene, and then you transition into the actual game level, it's a different scene. And so they're just logically broken up like that. And the, the view controller and the app delegate are the ones that, that might confuse you a little bit. The view controller, basically like a director of a movie, it, it just is responsible for loading the first game scene. So you'll see in there, there's a little bit of code, it's saying load this scene first, and that's basically all that's in it. And the app delegate is responsible for starting and stopping your application. So when, when the user first touches the screen and launches your app, uh, code gets run in the app delegate, you got quiet. And Stuff like what happens when you press the home screen and minimize your game, that code is in the app delegate. So it's like a high level 
of your application, but there's really no game specific stuff in there. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna talk about two D games. Um, really, Sprite Kit is is for two D. So this is just the simple little x y graph of what the coordinates mean. Uh, so the positive side of your x and y is the visible part of the screen. You can place things in the negative; they'll be off the screen. You place things if your say your resolution is 300 by whatever. If you place it 400, then it's you know the object is saying that it's up there, but there's no screen to draw it on. So you have all this space you can move things around in, positive and negative and off the screen, um, but then you have your visible part there. Everybody following that? Does that make sense? Thumbs up from John. I think this is my last slide, not very slide heavy. And when we start looking at the game scene, uh, there's only a few little functions in there, and the, the main part is, is your, your game loop, which is your update function. And this is where most of your logic is gonna happen, because it this is the part that gets called every time um, in your, your, the frequency of your frames per second. So how many times do you want the game to draw to the screen, basically. So it's just constantly looping through this thing, and it'll do it'll follow the steps in your game loop every time. And you want to shoot. The default is about 60 frames a second, and that that lets it draw fast enough that everything looks smooth. And what you'll find is there's a balance there, like how much logic can you do in your game loop, and have it complete before it has to draw again. And if you start doing too much, you'll notice. It'll go from 60 to 50 to 40, and it starts looking really bad, and it's getting choppy because it can't draw fast enough. So there's, there's the balance there of um, making sure you, you do things quickly enough, and you, so your logic happens and you're checking for collisions, but you're still allowing it to draw fast enough to achieve whatever results you want. 60 frames or 30 or whatever that may be. And... Uh, we're going to bring up a new project. So, that's not what I want. Let's go to new project, and we're making this for iOS. You'll see there's a, there's a game here template. All this uh, meeting, and you can you can do this in either Swift or Objective C. Uh, I'm used to Objective C, so we're just gonna uh, do that. And there's actually a few different type of Sprite Kit projects. Uh, Scene Kit, no, I haven't really messed with. Sprite Kit is just like Cocos 2D, which I was used to using. Uh, there's OpenGL and then there's Metal, which is supposed to be uh, a little bit better graphic performance out of that. But we'll just do Sprite Kit. And you can target specific devices, iPhone, iPad, I'll leave it a universal that has settings for, for all the devices. I'll just put it here. All right. So here's our, our default project. There's the app delegate, the game scene, and the view controller. There's a bunch of settings, all this stuff down here. The products is where the, the app file actually gets built when you build it. But let's uh, see in this Oh, and if you're not, you're not familiar with Objective-C, um, everything's broken up into a, like a header file, which is the H file, and the class, and it's just, you have like the interface defined here, but all the actual code is in the, the .m file. 
Um, Come off. Yeah. Let's see. And um, see, there's stuff in here for uh, the application launching. Did it go to the background? And really, by default, you don't have to you don't have to put anything in here. Um, it's when you have specific things you want to happen when it goes to sleep and all that. You have to modify this later. Um, the view controller uh, sets up. Your screen size has a few flags for whether to show the frames per second while you're debugging. Um, and basically, it, it loads your scene. And this one's named Game Scene. That's the one that is part of the default project. And it does present scene, which actually loads it up. So there's, there's not a lot happening here either. It's just basically sets up your first scene to run. Let's, uh, let's run this guy real quick so you can see what the default project does. That is too big. That's way too big. Let's set it. Um, and in Xcode, you can, in the simulator, you can simulate all these different devices, iPads, iPhones, all different resolutions. And um, what you'll find out is they all look huge on a little screen because the resolution is so high on this thing. So I'll try and find one that actually fits on here. So that's all that their little project does. It's a hello world with a uh, spinning spaceship thrown on top of it. And when you, when you click, it just adds more of them. Um, and so that's, um, and you'll see when you added all these little frames per second, you probably can't read that, it goes down to 30 because now it's chugging along, it's got too much going on even in this simple little demonstration. Um, but that's not a very good game project start at all. I don't know why they... I, eh, I mean, it's, it's something, but... Um, we're going to build a, a something a little bit better than that. So, uh, let me go over this game scene real quick. The, um, there's, there's basically three functions to find here. The did move to view is, is your function that initializes. It gets called once when the scene first loads. And you do stuff in here um, that you want kind of set up for your scene. So if you want to, like this is loading that hello world uh, background label. So if you want to do that, do that here. It just happens once. If you want to load up some stuff in the memory, some sounds or define some variables um, that help set up your scene. Um, that's what the did move to view function is for. And a little bit about, about Sprite Kit. The uh, self refers to the scene. And you can have uh, the frame is the size of it. So if you need to get details of what size screen you're actually on, you can refer to it that way. Because if you if you target universal, you may not know what what device this is, what pixels you know your screen actually is. So um, you can code it in kind of in a generic way to say, give me give me the the middle of whatever screen size this is. Give me the middle Y of it. And that'll be my position to draw this label. So it kind of draws it exactly in the center of the screen. And you can you can do stuff in a relative way like that. I've had I've had trouble doing that once you get very complicated games because 
if you don't have exact uh, screen resolution in mind, it's a little crazy, but uh, some things, if you know you always want a dead center, you can do that here. If you put in the background, if it's full screen, you can always just drop it in the dead center. Um, and you have all these touch events that are available. So if you want to do something when the user first touches down to the screen, uh, there's a touch began event uh, that's available to you. All you just have to implement it. And there's others. See, there's a, there's a touch ended, there's a uh, began, there's move, there's canceled. And so the, uh, the device is always figuring out what's being touched and where, and so it just gives that back to you at a high level. You don't have to do much to get that information. And when you first touch down is the touch began. And if you leave your finger down and move around, that's the touch moved event will fire. And once you take your finger off, is the touch ended? So you can uh, you can handle a variety of different gestures and movements, and you can handle multiple touches and get reads on it. It'll give you every point that's, that somebody touched. Um, so if you if you're trying to capture complicated gestures, you still have to do a little bit of code. Like if you're trying to capture certain pattern of touches and it's moving around you have a lot to keep track of um, our simple game we're gonna just touch began and ended start with and this this project right here just it just shows you uh, began and it'll actually return uh, it's a list of every touch so there, it's it's a loop you can do a loop and handle it for every touch that it gives back to you. So if you touch down with three, it'll loop three times, tell you, hey, there's this coordinate here, this one here, and, and this one. And if you care about the other two touches, you can loop through and do something for all of them, or if you just care about the first one, you can ignore the rest. Um, so, and then there's the update function uh, with the interval 60 is set at 60 frames, so it gets called 60 times a second. And this example isn't doing anything in there, uh, so we'll add some stuff in there in a minute. Any questions on the uh, game scene, how it's set up at this point? Everybody excited? Yeah. Chuckles, yeah. couple smirks, yeah, okay. Okay, now the air is kicking up again. It's a large room. Um, well, I, was, I think I'm just going to cut to. I did this presentation before and I coded everything out, but it, that's kind of slow and I was explaining every little function. But what I wanted to do is just cut to my example um, project and then I'll explain a little bit of what I changed and see if there's any questions and I can explain some things further there. So you don't have to watch me type out all of these little lines of code. Um, here's my sprite kit test project and you'll see it's not a whole lot more code. It's just... Um, a little bit more. We still got the the did move to view function, which initializes the scene. There's the touch began. Uh, I'm using the touch ended. I wrote this function called create asteroid, and I'll I'll get into that. I have this random number function help me out, and most of it happens in the update. You'll see I, I put most of the logic in here. And uh, let me just run this guy, and then we'll start looking at the little pieces of it. <clears throat> so I made this little spaceship game, and you, uh, you just basically move your spaceship left and right, <clears throat> and asteroids come down. 
and you try to avoid them, and it keeps score. So every one you pass, you get 100 points, and if you get hit, you uh, reset your score. So there, it's just just enough logic to show you the uh, you know the skeleton of a game. It's actually keeping some score. It's got some collision in there. And it's got some movement, and um, you know some graphics that are a little bit better. And there's there's a lot a lot to do with this game if you actually want to flesh it out. Uh, you'll see it, the collision is not very good. It's pretty pretty loose. You can kind of get close to something and get hit. Uh, there's no lasers. There's no explosions. There's nothing really cool happening. But it's a good start. So let's go back. So in this game, I'm using some different graphics. Um, phases. Hmm. And I pulled them off this website, this, uh, this um, free game art. I'll share that link with you a little bit later. But I just pulled in the um, this little spaceship and this little asteroid. So um, you can you can drag them directly in here if you want. I mean, if you get fancy, you'll end up doing a sprite sheet and all this kind of stuff to save memory. But just getting started, just just drag some art in here, stick it in the uh, the 1x setting. These are different settings for how it scales your, your game. If you really support all devices, then you would have different sized artwork so it, it scales properly. Uh, I just drug one in here and just drug the spaceship in just to get started. So in this did move to view, um, I'm setting up just a black color background. You can do that. Um, if you want to set the, some properties on the the view itself, you can you can get get a reference to it with self and do background color, black color. Um, now loading up a sprite is it's pretty easy with with the high level functions it gives you. So over here, I, def I define this um, the spaceship sprite, and you'll see everything is for the sprites. It's prefixed with SK for sprite kit. So it'll be SK sprite node, SK node, SK uh, animations. Yep. And um, if you if you want. To define some stuff that's visible everywhere in your scene, you can define it over in the uh, the header file inside these brackets for the for the interface. So if I define the spaceship here, I can refer to spaceship in any function inside that scene. It's you know global there, um, and you'll you'll find you'll you'll do that a lot of times for game stuff because you'll want to refer to the all these objects inside the scene and all these different places. Um, you, can, you can go get a reference to it if you do it in a little function, but it's, it's better off just putting it all in the header file so you can easily change all these things from anywhere. Um, so here's my, you define a sprite node, with SK sprite node, and this uh, means it's a pointer. Um, all these kind of objects are, in, are basically pointers to something. So you have, people probably start falling asleep now, but then, you know, you have your integers and your booleans and those are, you can define them just straight up. Um, like this asteroid count. It's an integer, when you refer to it, you're actually referring to the value 
And for complicated objects like like a sprite, you have a pointer to it to the sprite. There's all kinds of properties to go along with it. So um, you define it with that little asterisk. So to create this this the spaceship node, you do a SK sprite node sprite node with image named and you just tell it the, the name of the PNG file that you drug in or the JPEG or whatever it was. Uh, probably PNG because you want the transparency around the game objects. And uh, there's different ways to create it but um, you can do a sprite node from a texture if you have a texture map. Uh, you can do colors on top of them but the uh, the image name is just uh, an easy way to do it straight off the image itself. And the scale is, you know, if you want to size it up or down. So this is a, one is 100%. So I'm saying I actually draw this at 20% because I drug these in from a free website and I didn't resize them. So that the spaceship is actually huge. It's like 2,000 something by whatever. So I'm just saying size it down to 20%. And the position we want to put it at, uh, we need an XY coordinate for where we want to place this thing on the scene. So we can use these functions uh, to get, get the middle X of the scene, so that'll be um, your left and right, um, your X from zero to whatever. So it'll give you, if you say get, get the middle of this frame, it's going to give you the, the center. And 100 is how high I wanted it. So I just wanted it 100 pixels up. Just because I want that spaceship to stay down at the bottom, or we would just move it left and right. And to actually have it draw, you just say, um, add this child to yourself, and that'll, that'll make it draw. Uh, whenever, whenever the next draw call comes around. It doesn't immediately happen, but, but it's there. It's, it's ready to do stuff. I'm also creating a label for the score. So there's a SK label node you can use for text and you can give it a font name. So it kind of helps you not have a texture map for all these fonts, just built in ones you can use. I'm using this chalk duster one, which was the one the demo was using. I give it um, uh, just this default text of score. I set the font size, and once again, I tell it where I want it in the X, Y coordinate. So I wanted this one up top. So I get the middle X, so I'm going to draw it directly in the middle of the screen. And I get the top Y, and I just say, go down 50 pixels. So it's just a little bit below the top, so it's visible. And... Um, that's pretty much all I needed to do to set up the view. I just needed a black background, a label, and the spaceship. So when you start, that's all you see. And I have, I have some variables for how many asteroids I want to draw and stuff like that. I'll get into that. Um, so does that, that part make sense? Setting up the scene, background, spaceship, nothing really happening. So you said that the frame rate can get really bogged down and can go really slow. So were you dragging in that sprite of the ship and then saying you take the size to 20%? Yeah. Is that adding extra work to it that could, that could bog down that frame rate? And so like along those lines, would it be more effective to actually resize the image? Or the second part of this question is, without a graphical GUI interface, yeah. is it easier just to do what you've done here and then look at it visually? Yeah, I mean, this is this is sloppy. This is you know, um, just get started really quick. Yeah, it's definitely adding overhead because the the amount of memory that is taken up is the full size of the sprite, even though it's scaling it down to draw it. So you only have a limited amount of memory to work with on while your app is running, and you've loaded this huge image in there that you're not taking advantage of because you're only using a small one. And then the scaling too, it does have to calculate that. So yeah, it's, you don't want to do that um, 
any real game. And um, what's the second part was... Like, without the GUI interface, yeah. you can't really see and move things around and, and scale them physically. Like, is this, is this idea easier, like, to bring it in and then look at it and say, oh, that's too big? Yeah, and, and, you know, you won't see any performance hit for a while. So you could do this and even certain types of games you wouldn't see any performance hit at all because, yeah, it is, it is less efficient, but uh, you still may have the games run, the, the hardware so fast that it may not matter, you know, whether it's efficient or not. Um, but yeah, it's, um, and it's always easier to just, for me to draw it out on paper, like, hey, I know this is whatever, 2,000 pixels I'm working with, and I'll just place it this many pixels, and then I'll run it, and if it doesn't look good, I'll move it, you know, move it some more. Um, a lot of trial and error like that, but this is definitely... Um, if you're just playing around, this is a quick way you can say, well, I don't know how big I want it. Let's make it 20% just to see how it looks. Let's make it 30. Let's make it 40. Oh, it looks pretty good, you know. Um, so, yeah. And um, any other questions? No? Good. All right. So for the, um, for the touches begin, um, I want to move the ship every time you touch down. But what I, what I wanted to do, if I handle the movement in the touch begin, what you'll have is one little bitty movement every time you put your finger down and you have to keep tapping it. So um, you would only get that function called every time you touch the screen. And while your finger's there, it's not gonna get called again. So um, what I was doing with this game is I just, I set a flag to say, you know, should I be moving the ship right or left? And as long as you keep your finger down, it keeps moving. So kind of like in an arcade game, when you hold the joystick left or right, you know, the character would keep moving. It's that idea. So you, um, you're just keeping track of where the player is, is keeping their finger down to know which way to move it. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm trying to figure out which side of the screen did you touch in because I was going really simple with it. You can touch, just split the screen straight down the middle and if you touch on the left side it goes left. If you touch on the right side I'm going to move it right. So it's not very specific like you don't have to touch the corners, you can touch anywhere on one side or the other. And that's just to get started, you know, to have something moving. So what, what you get here is you get the location that the person touched. And I just say, is the, um, is it greater than half the screen or is it, you know, left, less than half the screen? And I'll just say, I want to move the ship right or left. Um, but I don't actually do the movement here. I just set the flag and I'll use it later. And then on the touch ended, when they take their finger off the screen, I, I want to stop the ship moving. So I'll just clear both of those flags saying, hey, I'm not moving right, right or left. You know, no one's actually touching the screen at this point. And uh, let's we'll skip down to the update. This is where stuff's actually happening. Um, so this is, this is being called every time. Let's, let's take a look at the movement here. So I'm doing the movement in the, uh, in the update. So I'm just checking that flag, and if the flag is saying, hey, the ship needs to move right, then I'm changing the position of where the spaceship is. So I'm just taking the current X of this spaceship, and um, this is to make sure that I don't move it off the screen, actually. So I don't want to just move the spaceship completely off the whole screen if, if you're still touching, so I'll stop it at the edge. Um, so as long as you're within, your spaceship is still within that half of the screen that's visible, then I'll move it. So that's what this if statement's doing. And to move it, you just give it a new position. So we're just saying, make the position, uh, the current position, plus five pixels. So I'm just going to shift it five over. 
and I'm going to leave it on the same the same Y as it currently is because we're just moving left and right. And same thing with uh, moving left. I'm just saying, is it still on the bounds of the other side of the screen? And I'll just take five away from it, move it the other direction. And you'll see. Um, let's put a little breakpoint. If we run this. I'll put it on the right side. So I touched on the uh, touched on the the right side of the screen in this update statement. You'll see that it stops and it's about to uh, move it there. Oh, whoops! Uh, let's stop it. So every time we, we touch down, it's, it's firing this little logic here. It's not going to let me hold the screen because it's breaking, so that's taking me off the, off the simulator. Um, so that gives us our movement. And um, what, what I'm doing here is I want to have a bunch of asteroids come down in different different uh, different positions. So I want it to be kind of random. So I want some to just be randomly different uh, different X coordinates on top of the screen. I'll draw them on top and then I'll just tell them to move down. And there's only a maximum I want to have. So I have this number of, uh, of 10. And you'll see I define this this asteroid count up here, I want to keep track of how many I have. Because I don't want to just keep continually drawing, then you'll have asteroids everywhere and the game starts running bad. And um, Since it's in the update loop, it would get called, it would draw like 60 a second, it would quickly bomb out. So every time this runs, I'm checking to see, hey, do we, uh, you know, do we have 10 asteroids or not? And I have this flag to see, am I, am I waiting on one to be drawn? Because I want to also space out the time they're drawn. So I don't want just constant one every second. It just looks like they're constantly falling down. I want to maybe draw one in one second, draw one in two seconds or three, so it looks a little more random. You'll end up incorporating all kinds of randomness into your, your game. So you'll want to get these um, actually, there's not a good way to get a random number in uh, Xcode, so I had to. You have to do a little function like this to say, "Give me, give me a random number between these two things." So that, that's all this little function does here. And I use it several times um, using this func using this this built-in random function, which is a decimal and it does some stuff with it. But, anyways. So we're seeing, you know, do we need to draw another asteroid, yes or no? And I'm going to get a random time between one and five seconds that I want to draw it. And in Xcode, if you want something, you want a function to be called in the future, you can do this perform selector. And it's saying, I want to call this function create asteroid after a certain delay in time. So I want to. I'm going to add. A, well, I'm adding at least one second. So I'm not going to draw it any sooner than one second. And then I'm going to do um, this random time uh, divided by ten. You know, you just get a feel for. You just work this formula to do whatever gives you the visual result. You know. Um, so every time this comes through, we're going to check to see if we need to draw a new asteroid. We're going to check the player's movement and move if we need to. And down here, I'm going to do a uh, check for collision of asteroids. But um, let's look at this create asteroid real quick. 
So every time I want to create an asteroid, um, I get I get a uh, a random position. So once again, I want to draw it somewhere on the x that's different every time. So I get a number between one and the uh, the width of the screen. So I end up drawing it any of those pixels. And we create a uh, asteroid sprite. And this one is defined right here. So it's not, I'm not defining this global because I'm just, I'm creating one every time I need one. So this is a brand new um, allocation of memory for this asteroid. I'm gonna load it right from that image, that PNG. I'm gonna scale it down once again because I've put these huge files in here. Um, you can actually, uh, the, uh, it's misspelled because the, the images were misspelled when I downloaded them, so I thought it was cool just to leave it. Uh, I, I know how to spell asteroid, but um, I thought it was funny just to leave it that way, so. The guy can draw, but he can't spell. So, uh, I'm giving this specific name so I can find the sprite later. Since, I, since the, um, the variable is not global, I won't be able to get that variable later, but I can, I can find it with this name. I'll, I'll show you how to do that later. And then I give it the position, um, the X, and I do it. This is the entire height of the screen, the visible height of the screen, and then I add the height of the asteroid to it, so I draw it right above where the visible screen is. So you want to draw it right in the in the, the screen because it'll kind of like jump in there. So you draw it outside the screen, you can move it in. Uh, so then I add that. Uh, it, it would draw it, but it's it's not visible, so it's just gonna not really draw anything. And the nice thing about Sprite Kit is all these it has all these built-in actions that you can use for movement, for rotation. Uh, you can do do paths so you can with different coordinates and you can do all kinds of um, things in just a couple lines of code. So we make a new sprite kit action and I'm calling this move asteroid. And I'm gonna say move to uh, this is uh, you'll see the CG point make is making a XY point. Because most of the sprite kit uh, Actions and everything need one an x y point is, and that's an object. So you just create it with the an x and a y. So I'm saying move it to this position, um, wherever the x was currently. That random x number, I want to move it straight down. So I'm still moving it there. Um, but I want to move it. Zero is the bottom of the screen, minus the asteroid's height. So I'm taking it right down below the visible screen. So. You know, visible screen here, I'm saying draw it, move it straight down and stop right here, basically. And do that over four seconds, you give it a duration. And these are for actions where you just want to set it and let it go, right? And then uh, I thought it would be cool to rotate the asteroid around a little bit. So I'm doing a, uh, another sprite kit action, a rotate action. And I want to rotate it by uh, this angle um, that's, is that like a full, I think that's a full rotation. And the duration, how long I want it to take to rotate around, I'm using another random number. So some will spin faster, some will spin slower, and so you get some randomness to that animation as well. And so this action isn't really tied to anything. I just created this rotate action here that's not, it's not tied to the asteroid at all. So you have to add it to it. You have to say, asteroid, run this action, or the sprite kit action, and you can tell it to do it once or repeat forever or repeat so many times. So I'm just gonna say, rotate this asteroid forever. And I, keep track of my asteroid count, I add one to it, and I say, okay, I'm currently, I'm not waiting on another asteroid to be drawn right now. Um, so what happens is these things can be called in different, different orders, because it's, 
it's um, you know multi multi threaded environment. So you you need to set ver uh, booleans you know in certain cases where you don't want the thing to be called over and over again, or it's doing something and you're checking a flag that's um, that's not set yet. So you have to kind of keep track of um, what's going on and, and setting these kind of flags once you've completed an action or you're waiting on something there's a way to make sure they don't get called over and over again. Um, any questions on creating the asteroid or the um, sprite kit actions, the move and the rotate? It's exciting at all? Everybody getting something out of this? Code can be kind of boring, so, you know, <clears throat> there's not much left. So, we've got, uh, we're drawing asteroids. Uh, drawing them right here, we're checking, do we need to draw new objects? Uh, we're doing the movement here. So really the other piece of what you want to check in a game loop is, is, any, is anything collided? You know, what's, is the state of your game changed? So, in this game, if, if I want to get, since I named those objects Asteroid Dark, um, I, can, I can enumerate through every object in this game that's named Asteroid Dark, if I want to get, if I want to figure out something about it. So, enumerate is a fancy word to say I'm going to loop through all these things. So, it's going to give me a collection of all the current game objects that are named this, and then I can loop through them and do something with them. Um, see this, uh, the loop actually goes down to here. So, so for every one of those objects, it's gonna check all this, this code for every asteroid object that's currently alive, basically. So I want to see uh, the node refers to the asteroid. So um, in your loop, what this is doing is it's giving you every asteroid object and it's referring to it as a node. So in here you can say, well, if this node intersects the spaceship, basically are those two sprites overlapping each other? You know, are the x y coordinates intersecting at all? And this is a just a high level helper function to, so you don't have to do the math. You don't have to say, well, this one is this size and the top corner is 32 and it's whatever. It's just, it's going to check whether they're intersecting at all. And I have this, um, this Boolean for is the ship currently damaged? So what I want to do is when the ship gets damaged, I'm going to I flash it red and I reset the score and I want to wait until that that red flash is finished. So I don't want to just you hit three asteroids and it flashes three times and it just resets it three times. I want to only do it once until it's completed. Um, so if it if you know the ship just hit an asteroid and it's not damaged, I'm gonna clear my score and I have to actually change the, the uh, the text of the label to reflect that because I've changed the value of this score but that's not going to draw the change of the screen so I have to actually uh, use my label which is the score and change the text to um, this is saying the string score and this is substituting in that zero for it so just change that to zero I'm saying well, well now the ship currently is damaged so I don't want anything else to happen while I'm doing this action right here. And I add an action to the spaceship. So I create a new action. Um, and what you can do is you can also make an action sequence. So if you want, you want to chain a bunch of actions together, you can create the sequence and then say, do all these to this object. So I'm creating three actions here. I'm saying I want to colorize this, this sprite with the color red and I want to blend it. 
So I'm taking the sprite that's currently black and blue. I want to blend red on top of it so it looks like it's damaged. I'm not actually, you know, I don't actually have a red spaceship in my project. You know, I'm just blending it uh, right here. And then I'm saying wait for one second, basically. Just just wait. Don't. Part of my string is just to hold on. And then I'm saying um, blend it back. And it, this, this duration is how long it, it fades it. So it's going to blend it back to... Um, this is blending with a, a 1, which is like a full capacity. And this is going to blend it to 0, which is not going to show it at all. And over you know, a fraction of a second. So it's just going to flash red, wait a second, and then flash kind of fade back to normal. So it just gives you like a pulse effect. I actually called it pulse, okay. And uh, so then I say, okay, run the action on the spaceship. So it's gonna apply this string of actions to it. And since I didn't specify how many times to do it, it just does it once. I don't have any uh, with duration added on there to tell it to keep doing it. The default is just one one string of actions. Um, and then I'm saying, hey, I got this, um, I want to reset some stuff after this happens. So here in one second, I'm going to call this uh, ship reset action, uh, this function. And what I'm doing here is I'm just saying, hey, the ship's not damaged anymore. So it kind of, it flashes red, it's not going to flash again because it's kind of wait, in a waiting state until it's finished doing all this stuff. And then when it's done, I say, okay, it could, it could be damaged again. It's, you know, it's not currently damaged. So when this loop comes through again, it's going to say, hey, yeah, I am damaged if it's still intersecting and it'll just skip over it. Because um, what happens is when the ship and the asteroid intersect, they're actually going to intersect like 50, 100 times. Like, so every little movement, they're intersecting. And this would get called over and over and over again. So you just want to say, they've intersected. Just wait a minute, do your thing, and let it pass through. And then I'll say it. You can reset it now. Um, and the last part is, um, for all these asteroids, um, I'm saying... Hey, did the asteroid just, just finish drawing off the screen? Did, did the position actually go below zero? And if it did, then I'm going to add a score because it, it passed through, it didn't, inter it didn't intersect with the spaceship, it made it down to the bottom of the screen. So 100 points for you. And I'm going to update the score, and I'm going to actually destroy this asteroid. So I'm going to take one away from my count and I'm going to say remove this from the parent. So that doesn't actually remove it when you say that, but it marks it for, for removal at its convenience, basically. It says, hey, I'm done with this memory. I'm done with this object. It's, it's removed from the parent. You can't actually get back to it. And then the game will free up the memory whenever it feels like it or it's forced to if you run out of memory. So that's that's a pretty complete um, update loop. Che checking condition, movement, and checking for some collision. And I think that was all the code I had in here. So we'll run it once again, just see it in all its glory. Um, so I can move left and right. There go the asteroids. See a different different rotation on them. This one's moving pretty fast here. Um, you could even move them different speeds if you wanted to. They're all moving at four seconds, but if you wanted um, some to fall down faster than others, then you could put a random number into the duration. And then when you hit one, you'll see it flashes red. It just flashes red once. That's that's the little game. So right. so 
So any more questions on stuff here? Any part of code you want to look at again? How many, how many work hours is that? Um, uh, maybe a couple. <laughs> um, yeah, I did it and then I wasn't really, I, I did it for a talk here at the Iron Art actually and then I was like, man, that's not, Really fancy enough, so then I came back and I added the rotation and stuff. But um, yeah, it wasn't hardly much time at all. And but this this was actually the first thing I built in Sprite Kit, so it was more. I was trying to figure out how it was different from Cocos 2D, and it's almost not different at all. It's just the things are named a little bit different, but the structure is pretty much the same. Uh, even the functions look the same. But yeah, you can get this going uh, in no time. Unless you're just not familiar with Objective-C and then, you know, that's, that's going to take a little bit of time for when to use a pointer and when not and some things like that. And um, I think the good thing about SpriteKit is um, even if you're not familiar with the language, you can still kind of power through it because you don't have to write a lot of code to make a lot of these actions. You can do something, uh, I mean, this is almost a working game and there's barely any code here so you know if you wanted to have shoot missiles and things blow up that's not much more code than what you've got so I think you can move pretty quickly with it um, so I haven't built a full game in it, so I don't know. I haven't got to the point. Um, but I think most of the things I've done in Cocos 2D, I mean, the games I built all still had simple, simple actions with them, you know, even, I mean, the cowbell game, that was mostly music timing and stuff, but the loop and the logic wasn't very complicated at all, and the movements weren't complicated, so it was just, the same actions, the same um, blending colors and whatever. So I think that would be pretty much directly go right over. You know, and you don't have to import a framework. You don't have to have the, the different versions of the framework, and that's a little bit nicer. The uh, the universal graphics is something I haven't spent enough time with to know. You know, do I still need to bring in one copy of everything or can I scale it around and get by with it and everything still runs fast enough? You know, so kind of what, what you mentioned the scaling before, if you just want to bring in one set of graphics, you know, the, the plus to that is you've only drawn one set of graphics and you only have memory for one set. You just take the largest one and then you scale down from there. So if you want a different size axis, right? Yeah. But then if, if you, you know, because the aspect ratios of the screen aren't the same, so if you start to deviate from just a straight scale and you want different sizes, then you can end up with your large asteroid and your small one, and so you have all that in memory, kind of. I think Sprite Kit offers some new things to only bundle um, the relevant graphics, which didn't used to be the case with Cocos 2D. Because in my, the games I wrote there, I had all the graphics were in there. So when you downloaded it, it had all the HD graphics, all the small ones. Yep. How do you add what, like audio cues and things like that in there? Or as you mentioned that under the demo, sorry. Yeah, so you can, you can play MP3s, you can play whatever sound files and... Um, Node, um, how do you do it in Sprite Kit? And it's uh, it's an SK action. SK action? You can play that just a small audio file on SK action. Okay. So, like, if you wanted an asteroid to explode and go, yeah. And then would you just put it in SK action and then make it play that in the file? I know in, in Cocos 2D there were different methods depending on what you wanted to play and what kind of control you wanted over it. If you just wanted a simple, play this right now, there was an easy way to just call that. 
I guess in Sprite Kid, you can do it that way. Yeah, and you could you could get specific control over where things are and the tempo and all that kind of stuff with different play methods if you needed it. So there, there's different ones. There's high level ones and low level ones available, just depending on what you needed. And there's a there's a number of course of how many simultaneous uh, types you can play. Like MP3s have to be decoded, so you can you can only play a certain number of those, and then. Um, but you can do more waves and stuff that aren't having to be uh, decompressed or you know whatever. So you, you can mix mix and match if you're doing a whole lot of sounds, just depending on what you can get away with and the memory you want to use up. All right, no more questions. Eight o'clock. Wow. Thank you very much.